we talk a lot about Medicare for all on this program, and I'm constantly making the case, it feels like it's constant, that uh, we can't afford not to switch to Medicare for all. But of course, I don't have any hard data or economic research to back that up. Fortunately, our next guest does. He's just uh, co-authored a major study on the economic impact of Medicare for all. And uh, I think uh, it's good news, I think, but he'll tell us. Robert Poland is Distinguished Professor of Economics and co-director of the Political Economy Research Institute, or PERI, at the University of Massachusetts in Amherst. Uh, he is also the founder and president of PEA. P-E-A-R, Poland Energy and Retrofits in Amherst, and he's written a number of books on economics. We could list them, but I want to get to the core of the argument. He is lead article, uh, lead author of this new article, Economic Analysis of Medicare for All. I guess it's a study or a white paper, but he'll tell us. First of all, Bob Poland, thanks for coming on the program. Well, thanks very much for having me on. And I guess, is this a white paper or a, it's a study? I want to use the right terminology. Yeah, it's, um, at this point, it's 200 more, more pages. It's kind of like a book equivalent. It's it's book length. Um, yeah, so we put it out at Perry. It's online. Anybody can get it. But whatever we want to call it, it's, yeah, it's, it's a pretty in-depth analysis of Medicare for All. Yeah, and I think given the length, and I have it in front of me, we will stick to the highlights. But... Um, but the highlights are, are good. I, uh, basically, as I understand it, uh, you took the basic contours of, uh, of a previous Medicare for All Act, uh, along with some illustrative examples of where the revenue might come from, to look at the macro or the overall impact of uh, Medicare for All on the health economy, right? Yeah, I mean, this thing, obviously... The question that we want to answer is, uh, does Medicare for all achieve, could it achieve what it aims to achieve? And that what it aims to achieve is to provide everybody with high quality health insurance so that they can be get high quality health care and to do that in a way that is cost effective. And that's that's basically it. That's the point. And our answer was Yes that we could cover everybody with decent coverage, including everybody who is either uninsured at present or underinsured, meaning by underinsured that they do have some form of health insurance, but that they are nevertheless um, inhibited getting the treatments they need because they can't afford the cost. So if everybody is going to be able to get uh, decent care, and without having to pay any kind of deductibles or co-pays, no out-of-pocket at all. And then even with that, what we find is that under Medicare for All, the whole system would be about 10% cheaper than the existing health care system that we have. So you put all that together, you've got a viable system, and then, yes, then we work through uh, the broader economic effects of the entire economy. So uh, let's start with the health care costs alone, because right now, uh, as I understand it, we pay far more for uh, health care than uh, any other developed country. And actually, I, I believe we get far less when you factor in the fact that as the only country without some form of, a developed country without some form of single payer coverage, we have a number of people un, uninsured. We have the problem, as you mentioned, of underinsurance. Yet, despite those sort of glaring holes that people, or human beings, are falling through, we pay more than anybody else. And I, your study seems to me, by the way, the findings seem to be very reasonable in that they don't, they don't look wild or pie in the sky. They're basically saying a 17, it's 17% 17 of the GDP. If it goes down by 10%, it's like 15% or so. Mm -hmm. So it's still above other countries, right? But we're, we're getting right. great coverage instead. That's it. Right. So, right. So we are spending, you know, around 17 or it may, it's even getting close to 18% of our total GDP. And that's $3.3 .3 trillion. So that's real money. 
uh, if you look at other advanced economies like Canada or Western Europe and Japan, um, they're spending between 9 and 11% of their entire economic activity or GDP. Uh, the difference between spending 11% of GDP and 18% of GDP in the U.S. is $1.2 uh, trillion. So uh, you could say we have a very inefficient system. On top of that, yes, if you look at overall health outcomes, uh, measures of, of outcomes such as infant mortality or life expectancy or uh, qualitative satisfaction with the health system, uh, we come out worse than the other countries that are spending you know, the equivalent of $1 trillion less than what we're spending. So uh, it's pretty clear that we have a very bad system. It's therefore not that hard to think of ways to improve the system if we just look at the models of other countries and take the best practices from other countries and see how they could apply in a practical way here. That's more or less what we did with this study. So, and again, we're talking with Robert Poland, a lead author of a new paper on the cost of Medicare for all uh, and the advantages of Medicare for all, savings Medicare for all. Um, Bob, I would also say that, you know, when we talk about underinsurance, we know we have a lot of uninsured people here. You mentioned the underinsured. OECD studies, I think I haven't looked lately, but years ago showed that uh, a significant number of Americans, middle class, presumably with health insurance, were deferring needed care because of the cost. We, you know, I, I know actuaries for the insurance industry have said that a uh, family of four with quote unquote good employer care still pays an enormous amount on average out of pocket for health care costs, and that's not even counting the employer portion and so on. So uh, we do have, when we, I feel as if uh, one of the things that you, that you try to address here, one of the lack of, uh, one of the unsubtle ways we talk about uh, health policy in this country is we just talk about insured and uninsured and we, we forget all those people who have insurance but still can't afford to go to the doctor. And that's a significant problem, right? Uh, yeah, huge. Um, well, uh, you know, what we did and what we did a lot in study, I mean, this is not hardly original, not the least bit original to me. Uh, the, the Commonwealth Fund, which is a research think tank um, that works on health care issues, uh, does surveys uh, and they they do surveys as to uh, the level of insurance and what they call under insurance. Um, and it's very valuable information. So uh, what they are, they come up with these different categories of people that, like you said, Richard, they, they have, they are covered by insurance. So they are covered, but uh, you then ask them, uh, well, when you need health care, uh, do you actually get the treatment that you need? And the answer is that um, roughly 26% of the population uh, does the following. They don't get a prescription filled. They skip a recommended test because they are afraid it's going to cost too much. They don't visit the doctor or clinic because it'll cost too much. And they don't go to a specialist if, um, if their primary care physician tells them they need to see a specialist. So that all adds up to, um, you know, 26% of the population. That's on top of 9% that's uninsured altogether. So we have over a third of our population in this country that is either uninsured or underinsured. Uh, and we are spending, you know, the equivalent of more than a trillion dollars more than other countries to uh, deliver a bad health care system. Yeah, it's, it's, it's uh, and such small portions is the old joke. Of. Um, so. Ha, I know the, that joke. Right, yeah. I figured you did. The, um, so uh, you assumed, in terms of uh, underinsurance, uh, you assumed, uh, what, no co-payments or deductibles in this, sort of first dollar coverage, as we call, used to call it? That's right. Yeah, so, and again, this is not my idea. This Basically, you know, we, we uh, did a study roughly, not entirely, but roughly based on the bill introduced into 
Congress in September 2017 by Senator Bernie Sanders. And in that bill, uh, which I think has, you know, close to 20 co-sponsors now, uh, right, there's basically um, first dollar coverage, uh, meaning no co-payments whatsoever. When you need to see a physician or other provider, you just go and you don't pay anything out of pocket. Uh, so that's really, and that's critical because as we see, um, people are foregoing necessary care because of the cost implications. And then on top of that, if they have some kind of serious medical condition, we know people experience very severe financial burdens to maintain health coverage, even when they have insurance. They face bankruptcy. People lose their jobs and they're covered through their jobs. They face, again, very serious problems just around health insurance. That shouldn't be. I mean, there's there's no reason whatsoever why, why somebody who is between jobs or is laid off uh, that they should feel that they no longer have medical care uh, as they need it. So, so the bottom line with your study, uh, Robert Poland, uh, uh, you and your co-authors found that we could give people the medical care they need without uh, forcing them to go without or uh, be harmed financially. We could give that to everybody in this country, and we would save what in the long run turns out to be a fairly significant sum of money, right? Yes, and we save money basically in three major areas. The first is a huge reduction in administrative costs. So right now, the private insurance system, administrative costs constitute somewhere around 12% of the total cost of, of running private health care. Uh, whereas under Medicare, for the system we have now for people 65 and over, uh, the administrative costs are in the range of 2%. So when we transition out of private health insurance into Medicare for all, we're going to get very, very large savings. We estimate that that would be about 9% of total system costs would be uh, saved by transitioning out of private health insurance uh, altogether. Then on top of that, uh, with pharmaceutical prices, what we did is saw the, the research, um, Canada... Uh, Western European countries pay roughly one half of what we pay in the U.S. for pres prescription drugs. And the reason is because the, the government's health insurance system bargains with the, pri the private pharmaceutical companies, and that drives down the prices. And so they, they're getting uh, prescription drugs for about half, and we say, okay, we won't go all the way down to half. We say we, we're going to lower prescription drug prices by 40%. And then the third big area is the, um, the fees paid for providers and hospitals. And in the Sanders bill, the proposal is that all providers are paid at Medicare, at the existing Medicare rates, as opposed to the rates that would be higher under private health insurance. And that gets us about 3% of savings. So overall, we say you can get to about 19% savings running Medicare for all relative to our existing system. Which seems to me to be modest and reasonable. Uh, now, unfortunately, we don't really have a enough time to go into the revenue side of it, where the money comes from. But you guys, for illustrative purposes, as you put it, uh, show that we could definitely uh, provide enough funding to cover it. I can't really, after reading your report, uh, I can't really see a good reason not to do this except that some very profitable companies uh, might not be profitable anymore, but I'm just disinclined to sacrifice human lives and well-being uh, just to preserve those profits, and I don't see it, any downside to moving to this system. Do you? Well, the only downside, uh, other than what you mentioned, which is that the pharmaceutical companies will see their profits dramatically cut, the private health insurance companies will go out of business. 
And then the the problem there is that there are, you know, there's 800,000 people working in private health industry and they will lose their jobs. So we do spend, and to my knowledge, it's the first time any study has looked into this. We do spend a considerable amount of time thinking about um, a just transition, so mm-hmm. a just transition for workers in the private health insurance industry and also the workers who are employed now at providers, at, at doctor's offices, dentist's offices, hospitals who are doing uh, the administrative work on that side, and a lot of them are, will become redundant. So we, we really work through carefully um, provisions to support these people so that they don't suffer when we transition to a Medicare for All system. Well, and I think that's great. I'm so glad you mentioned that because we do believe in uh, just transition as being part of this, and that's factored into your costs and so on, I assume, right? Yes, absolutely, yeah. All right, well, then then I really don't see a downside to doing it. The only people who lose out are the wealthy executives, and as far as I'm concerned, they can go get a real job. So Yeah, they can find other things to do. Yeah, or not, as, they, as, as the case may be. So unfortunately, we're going to have to leave it there, but Robert, uh, Robert Polin of uh, University of Massachusetts Amherst, thanks for uh, this great work, and thanks so much for coming on the program. I appreciate it. Thanks for having me on.